Okay, uh, Ken, I'm Christopher Queen. Um, I'm a lecturer on the study of religion at Harvard University, and two courses that I teach uh, at Harvard are Buddhism and Social Change and Buddhism in America. And my special uh, research in Asia has to do with the untouchables who have converted to Buddhism since 1956 uh, in their effort to overcome the abuses of the caste system. And um, I recently uh, wrote a paper on the concept of right speech uh, in Buddhism uh, because right speech uh, is one of the important uh, ethical tenets and also one of the steps on the Eightfold Path. So it's a very central idea of communication and also the notions of consumption and how those affect our behavior and our values. Okay. So um, what would you, what do you see as the road path to peace that w what we have now and what needs to change to make that a uh, more peaceful society? Yeah. Well, Buddhism, I think, is rightly famous for associating um, world peace or um, social peace with inner peace. And uh, it can be even you know, stereotyped or made into a cartoon, but the fact is that unless you have started to uh, evaluate your responses to situations and to become mindful of your attitudes and your emotions and uh, your behavior moment to moment uh, through meditation uh, and through self-reflection during the day you're not going to be able to promote uh, a better world situation so that uh, each person is um, enmeshed in a very complex web of relationships and forces in the world and this deep sense of interdependence uh, was really the insight uh, to which the Buddha awakened and which uh, started his own path as a spiritual teacher and then a movement which is now 2,500 years old. It seems to me that there's a continuum where you have complete inner peace and not paying attention to outer action, but then you have outer action without inner peace. Can you talk about that dynamic and where people should try to aim to be on that continuum? Well, it's a, it's a great question uh, for um, the Buddha liked to talk about seeking the middle path in situations, but I think we need to be careful not to strive for mediocrity. And so to say that in a continuum between mindless action and a kind of passive mindfulness, he wouldn't say, well, be kind of mindful and, and kind of get out there and do some action. I think Buddhists attempt to bring uh, their mindfulness into as active a relationship to a situation as possible. And um, it's not always easy, of course, because if there are a lot of stimuli flowing toward you, and I think the media is a good example of very complex stimuli that have been scientifically calculated to confuse you or to reorient your, uh, your um, perceptions then uh, mindfulness practice can really help you stay on target and remember why it is that you turn the television on or why it is that you open the newspaper and not be drawn off either by advertising or by the slant of journalism. Well, the Buddha liked to talk about uh, the middle path, uh, but I think we need to uh, distinguish that from mediocrity and trying to have a little mindfulness and a little action and not really end up going anywhere. Um, I think. Buddhist activists attempt to bring their mindfulness into situations of great um, complexity or conflict, which is a difficult thing to do because if you have many stimuli coming at you, uh, whether it's points of view or actual violence, uh, and Buddhism is active in many war zones in the world today, as you know, because uh, it started in Asia and continues to be practiced in countries like Burma and Cambodia and uh, Sri Lanka, Tibet that Buddhists in these situations are trying to bring uh, their nonviolence and their compassion, uh, but also their great uh, belief in, in human rights into play uh, with complete mindfulness, uh, but at the same time not get carried away uh, with blind passion. And uh, it's uh, something that we um, uh, can admire, but also attempt to emulate. So in the, the build up to the war in Iraq, there seemed to be a kind of a monolithic viewpoint that war was the only answer. Could you maybe provide an alternative to how that conflict was handled and um, how could have that been talked about mm. more? Well, at least where I live in Massachusetts, there was certainly not a monolithic um, 
uh, approval of the drift or the onslaught toward war. Uh, the peace movement was in fact very active uh, in Massachusetts and I remember uh, weekends driving out to the Western Mass where we have a little country cottage and seeing on all the overpasses to the highway um, peace activists uh, with their banners and so on and flash your lights for peace and you know, no, you know, don't attack Iraq and so on. So I think that there, the peace movement is actually awakened because of this war before, uh, during and, and hopefully after it will stay, stay alive. I think that in particular, perhaps from a Buddhist point of view, I think the war in Iraq is no different perhaps than the war in Vietnam, which sponsored a very strong peace movement, as you, as you remember, uh, with monks actually immolating themselves on the street to bring attention to the great suffering of the people in the country. Um, because Iraq is a Muslim country, uh, we haven't had um, uh, a Muslim peace movement in evidence. Uh, because, in fact, uh, the, the, the factions within Iraq uh, see the situation differently, and so it's harder, perhaps, for the um, uh, Muslim uh, peacemakers to be heard. I'm sure they're there. I have no question. I mean, Islam means peace, as you know. Um, but I think for uh, Buddhism to have um, any ef effect or any say uh, in a war which is um, not uh, really um, in a place where there are a lot of practicing Buddhists is difficult and um, this is an unusual situation where uh, the media are asking someone who uh, attempts to practice Buddhism um, to comment on the war. It's, it doesn't happen very often so thank you for doing it. Yeah, well I, I want to get kind of this perspective because I think I see what happens is that issues become very black and white and then either you're for it or you're against it and the kind of the shades of gray are eliminated. And um, can you talk about uh, seeing those shades of gray? Um, yeah. like One of the best known Buddhist teachers in the world today is the Vietnamese Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. And he wrote a famous poem many years ago uh, after the um, um, bombing of a Vietnamese city in, in which many of his friends and loved ones were killed called Call Me By My True Names. And in that poem, he tries to show that the, uh, the snake and the bug that it eats and the pirate and the girl who the pirate rapes, who commits suicide then, um, and the arms dealer and the rail thin child in Uganda who is uh, starving because of the arms trade in, in uh, his country are all part of the same process of human greed, hatred, and delusion. And that we cannot uh, sit back and judge uh, those who are involved in war or who are involved in oppression uh, as if we don't play uh, a key role in it. And calling me by my true names is calling me the human being that's part of this web of violence or the potential for peace. And recognizing that our choices, whether it's uh, as consumers or as voters uh, or as travelers uh, or as correspondents and writers or as readers, um, play very much a role in the kind of world that we have today. So can you um, comment on the, those three things, the uh, greed, hatred, and, and delusion, uh, and talk about it in the context of our American society of what it is today and how Buddhism could hope, you know, move to something beyond where we're at today? Mm -hmm. Well, I think America is a very fertile uh, uh, culture for Buddhism to take root and its Americans have been fascinated by the Dharma for over a hundred years. Even em Emerson and Thoreau knew something about Buddhism. They weren't quite sure whether it was Hinduism or Buddhism. But I think they, what they responded to was the notion of the sacred um, in nature and the sacred in, in the heart and uh, in, uh, in the universe and the, and the idea of participating in this kind of thing. Um, Hatred, greed, and delusion have their own American uh, flavor. And um, hatred, I think, uh, probably uh, has come along with the tremendous uh, military power and economic power that we now wield. I don't think our country was founded on hatred. It was founded uh, with a quest for independence and freedom. Uh, and um, yet, it's impossible to be a superpower or the only superpower without beginning to feel paranoid about losing what you have. And so, 
hatred is bred because we feel that uh, others are criticizing us or, or perhaps uh, impairing our uh, freedom to be, uh, to be comfortable or to be uh, rich. Um, greed, obviously, is a, is a product of our commercial capitalist system. And while um, it may be a joke uh, to say, as someone did this morning, that uh, to shop uh, is to be is to shop rather than to to think is to is to be or something that um, you know our consumer choices clearly do express um, who we are as a people and who we are as individuals and um, it is it is profoundly true and I think Madison Avenue and the ad industry knows it's profoundly true that the more you have the more you want and it never is over and the addiction that we have to forms of material consumption and to comfort and to thrills um, is, is a, is a never-ending uh, process for us, so that uh, we are being um, progressively hooked on, on so many more kinds of experience uh, and consumption than we even imagine, and each new um, form of media or each new invention um, opens up new possibilities of uh, psychological and physical addiction for us. So there are many kinds of drugs, and we're hooked on many of them. As far as delusion goes, um, all people are deluded to, in one way or another. Americans talk a great deal about education and the, and the importance of uh, childhood and college education. Um, but you know, what is the quality of the material that we're getting in the classroom or in the textbook? Who are the educators? And to what extent do communities participate in shaping uh, the education that they need for a healthy community? Um, you know, to what extent is education top down and not bottom up? And, and uh, how are people defining the kinds of things that they need to learn or the skills that they need to acquire. So education is a huge battleground in our society and the extent to which the globe or the, or the planet is part of our education and that young people today are acquiring a desire to know more about or to visit other parts of the world that they may see on TV and recoil from. I think to me is a, is a major question. International education, intercultural education, learning of languages. I mean very few people spoke Arabic it turns out in our country and therefore uh, we didn't know what our um, neighbors were saying about us. Most of it bad, but uh, we should have known that and be able to talk with them about uh, what's happening in their part of the world. Okay, and how do you see that, um, that if the media is uh, profit-based and people are just getting what they want. Why are people so attracted to violence? I wish I knew. I mean, it's, uh, okay. I wish I knew why people were attracted to violence. Uh, I said in my remarks uh, earlier uh, that uh, when so many of my friends said I had to go see the films Kill Bill 1 and Kill Bill 2, I finally did it. And I, I felt ashamed of myself because uh, the films were so well made. I mean, Tarantino is, is an amazingly skillful director. But I was ashamed of myself for enjoying those films because they were entirely about revenge uh, and mayhem. And uh, I also was shocked at the fact that uh, Uma Thurman, the star of the films, is the daughter of one of the great scholars of Buddhism and a student of the Dalai Lama himself, uh, Professor Robert Thurman. Um, certainly the martial arts theme in the films had to do with a kind of mysticism of killing or of uh, um, preci the precision and the fearlessness of the warrior and that comes from um, a perversion of Buddhism in Asia. Uh, but nevertheless it seems there's no excuse for putting the kind of money into films like that and then for people like myself who had the benefit of an education and exposure to Buddhism to go and see the film and even to find myself enjoying it. So I, I, all I can do is confess that I'm a part of this culture and I'm trying to work my way out of it or through it. Okay. So it, it, it almost seemed like the media was wanting to see that violence just as much as anyone else wanted to see a violent movie, that they were just almost egging on and, and getting up ready for war. So if that's the perception of reality that's being transmitted, then how, how are we going to achieve peace? I think America was truly um, um, stunned by our vulnerability on 9-11. And the thought that one could really identify the um, collaborators 
course, the perpetrators had killed themselves, so you can't very well bring them to justice, but the collaborators and the network, and somehow uh, decapitate the network. Uh, and then the fiction that, in fact, the country of Iraq was somehow connected to al-Qaeda, which we now know even this week from the hearings, has no basis in truth. This, I think, um, diluted many Amer Okay. It seems that the, the media knows, in a way, that, that the public has this innate desire to see violence. And so they were almost egging on and, and eager to, sh to have a war, to show these images, to have a lot of people watch. You know, how do you respond? You know, what, how, if that's what the system is, and how do you move forward and to try to convince people that this is not the right way? I guess I'm not uh, as cynical uh, as some uh, to believe that, for example, this time embedding so many uh, reporters and journalists within the troops in Iraq was purely to um, uh, dish out more violence for the public. Uh, I would like to think, and perhaps uh, as a uh, kind of Pollyanna a hope, that the embedding of journalists within the army is also to keep the army honest, as it were, and to document the way in which um, collateral damage happens, and that it's not merely combatants who are engaging in conflict and that it, in a free society, not to be able to take a close look at what our tax dollars and what our military establishment is, is doing is something that we demand, and it's not simply because we are addicted to violence. And, and so do you, do you see the only way to uh, moving towards uh, peace from, from these decisions of individuals, or is there something that governments can do to force peace? Well, governments have, are made of individuals, and um, it, it is amazing to think that uh, an interview with a government official might begin to make that person think again about policies that he or she had a, had a part to play. Um, and I think that our open society, insofar as citizens can get appointments with their representatives uh, or that um, high government officials um, um, attempt to have photo opportunities with town meetings when an embarrassing question might sh slip through uh, and the president or the secretary of state would have to answer somewhat candidly um, is a good thing. And, um, you know, democracy may not be perfect, but it's the best system that we have. And the media plays a crucial part in trying to open up as many back rooms uh, as possible. Okay. And how do you see that the our media system and our media cluttered environment feeds our greed. Well, I'm a I'm addicted to NPR and PBS, and so um, you know, in the evening when I sit down to watch the news with my family, uh, we're mainly watching uh, you know the the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, which doesn't have uh, commercial uh, breaks and it has a wide range of points of view. I, I like to hope or believe, uh, but at the same time, we're using our remote uh, and to try to check in on the. Um, mainstream media as well, and to try to see how the um, news is being spun for everybody else. And I think the remote control is actually an, an ethical device that you can, you know, uh, blot out as much of the advertising as possible and just try to, at least when you're in news mode or learning mode, uh, go for the information and go for the points of view. Um, of course, later in the evening when you're just kind of shutting down morally and mentally, uh, it becomes the entertainment device. Um, but nevertheless, I think, although I know my father would disagree, I think there is a range of uh, uh, viewpoints on, on TV and certainly in the print media. Um, and there are only so many hours in a day that we can compare them and reflect upon them. But um, having spent quite a bit of time in India, where even the Times of India is silent on much that goes on in the rest of the world, uh, I think we're quite lucky to have rich uh, sources of public information. And what would you say is the, the best teaching that Buddhism has to offer? <laughs> we had a wonderful disagreement among uh, three Buddhist uh, practitioners this morning about that. I was saying it's impermanence. And, uh, well, just say what you think. I what I think. I, I think the teaching of impermanence keeps us humble uh, and keeps... Okay, hold on a second. For, um, just 
frame it as you're the, the greatest or the for me the greatest okay, teaching okay. for me the greatest teaching of Buddhism is, is the teaching of impermanence mm -hmm. uh, and while it's true that the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said you can't step into the same river twice and Darwin talked about the evolution of all things or all biological things the Buddha really put an ethical spin on that and that impermanence gives us the opportunity to reach realization and awakening and uh, I've come to feel that the teaching of impermanence is one of uh, the highest teachings in Buddhism because it forces us to be humble about who we've become but hopeful about who we might become and of course Buddhism is an ethical system which encourages us to practice kindness uh, and compassion and so the impermanence of things means that uh, we always have another chance Okay, and if you could identify what's wrong with society now, and if impermanence perception was, was added, what would be the result, ideally? Well, I think if people were um, willing not to cling to uh, fixed ideas about the way the world uh, um, needs to be, and were willing to work together for a better world, and then to practice uh, some of the simple teachings for um, sharing and caring uh, for others, I think that uh, we would be able to change the world and um, to uh, produce a better outcome. Okay, great. I think that's great.